این واقعا با افتخار ماست که الان شما رو در مدرسه داریم حقیقتش معرفی شما هم سخت هم آسونه به این جهت که همه فکر میکنم شما رو میشناسن حتی کسایی که چهرتون رو نعیده باشن فکر کنم اکثر بچه که اینجا هستن مکانی کاماری رو از کتاب شما یاد گرفتن و لکشهاتون رو از یوتیوب دنبال کردن همکارا هم احتمالا وقتی که درس دادن مکانی کاماری از کتاب شما بوده من اگر بخوام خلاصه فقط عرض کنم برای که وقت سخن رو نیتون رو نگیرم دکتر پاردر اگر اشتباه کردم من رو تصیح کنین دوره کارشناسی و کارشناسی ارشدشون رو از دانشگاه کمبریج گرفتن و تو سال 1983 از MIT مدرک دکتراشون رو گرفتن یه چند سالی ریسرچ فلو بودن تو دانشگاه هاروارد و بعدش از سال 1986 عضو هیئت علمی حالا به زبان ما ایرانی ها دانشگاه MIT بودن موضوع تحقیقاتشون هم خیلی گسترده است مکانیک آماری غیر تعادلی فیزیک مواد نرم و بیوفیزیک هستش و چیزهای خیلی زیادی فکر میکنم از وبسایت دکتر کاردر میتونیم ببینیم افتخارات و جوایزشون رو هم دیگه فکر میکنم نمیشه لیست کرد و در این معارفه کتا گفت فقط من شاید دلم میخواد یه چیز خیلی کوتاهی رو که بگم بخش فیزیک زیستی اینجا تقریبا میشه گفت از نوادگان علمی دکتر کاردر هستن چون دکتر محمد رفی، دکتر ملکی، دکتر نجفی و دکتر فضلی اگر کسی اونجا ننداخته باشم همه دانشجوی دکتر گلستانیان بودن که دکتر گلستانیان دانشجوی دکتر کاردر بودن یه نوعی میشه گفتش که ایشون پای بزاره در حقیقت فیزیک بیوفیزیک در ایران هست فیزیک مباد زیستی من بیشتر از این وقتتون رو نمیگیرم چون که الان تو زمان سخنرانیتون هستم و باز هم تشکر میکنم که دعوت ما رو پذیر خیلی متشکرم خانم پروفسور زارعی از دعوتتون و از این معرفی بسیار جالب من بیشتر صحبتم در انگلیسی خواهد بود ولی میخواستم که یک تاریخچه رو براتون بیان کنم که الان این 26 امین مدرسه آموزش فیزیک دانشگاه تحصیلات تکمیلی علوم پاییز انجان هست و آشنایی من با این مرکز برمیگرده به حدود 29 سال پیش که یه دونه دعوتی داشتم از پروفسور سبوتی که ایشون در این نامه که برای من فرستادن اعلام کردن که مرکزی برای عالی ترین سطوح دانشگاهی فوق لیسانس و دکترا و پژوهش با معیاری به بین المللی در نظر دارند از یک سال پیش در اندیشه ایجاد چنین مرکزی بودیم مقدمات کار فراهم آمده و مرکز تحصیلات تکمیلی در علوم پایه در زنجان تأسیس شده است کار ایمد از فیزیک شروع کردیم و خلاصه متن این نام یک دونه دعوتی بود که در اولین در یک دونه برنامه تابستانی برای شروعی مرکز من شرکت کنم که این به حساب من که 28 سال پیش بود اگر این تاریخ الان شما 26 و این مدرسه آموزش فیزیک هستیم 28 سال پیش شماره منهای یک بوده در این مدرسه تابستون که ما شروع کردیم پارسال تعدادی... بخاطر اونه پارسال بخاطر کرونا یک دوره اگر حساب بکنین درست در میاد بله چون... درست در <تصفح> من اون حساب اون یک سالی که انجام نشدم کردم ولی با, با وجود این 28 سال پیش میشه شماره منهای یک و در اون تابستون ما که شروع کردیم در مرکز یک گروهی از دانشجویان برای دوره کارشناسی ارشد در این مدرسه ثبت نام کرده بودند که اسمشون اینجا هست و شاید خیلی از آنها رو شما بشناسیم ولی چیزی که جالب بود در اون موقع این مدرسه گاو زنگ زنجان در حال ساختمان بود و 
کلاسی که ما درس میدادیم تنها اتاقی بود که مثل این که تخت سیاه داشت و وقتی که ما داشتیم درس میدادیم بیرون کلاس صدای چکش و ساختمون و همه اینها برقرار بود با وجود این این دالقمت دو هفته یک کلاسی که من معمول بعد ما با هم کار میکردیم و پرابلم کلا... ست و همه چیز هم داشتیم و این کار انجام شد بعد متاسفانه از اون زمان من عکسایی نداشتم که نشونتون بدم دو سال بعدتر که میشه 26 سال پیش سال 95 به حساب من این تبدیل میشه به اولین مدرسه تابستانی فیزیک زنجان یک تعدادی از دانشجوهایی که در گروه اول بودن حالا به مقطع تحصیلی دکترا اومده بودن و یک دی دانشجوی دیگه هم بودن و چیزی که اتفاق افتاده بود که این بود که اون موقع دیگه مر... کلاس های خوبی داشتیم این عکسی هست از یک عده از دانشجوها این بلک بورد اون پشت چیزایی که من نوشته بودم روش و خیلی من همچنین مدیون هستم به پروفسور خاجه پور که خیلی در تمام این مراسم کلاس ها شرکت داشتن و کمک کردن و چیزی که برای ایشون و دکتر سبوتی خیلی مهم بود این بود که گلزار شده بود در خارج دیگه اون بیابانی که قبلا بود دو سال پیش ساختمون ها تموم شده بود و باخچه ها گل های قشنگی داشت و فرصت های زیادی بود که برای من با دانشجوهای مختلف صحبت کنم اینجا من هستم و رامین گلستانیان که صحبتشون بود بنابرای این گفتم این تاریخچه بود از به حساب من اولین برنامه تابستانی زنجان که حالا 26 مرسهش رو تشکیل داریم میدیم خلاص این یه صحبت کوتاه تاریخی میخواستم بکنم حالا میریسیم به اصل مطلب که میخوام به اگر اجازه بدین به زبان انگلیسی خواهد بود The topic that I'm talking about is range expansion So let me tell you what it is about and probably the easiest way to explain it is this experiment that was performed by Halache, Kerson, Ramanathan and Nelson back in 2007 so what you are looking at is the following. Uh, they dropped a collection of bacteria in the center of a plate, and then bacteria started to grow into the plate and expand, and that's what's called range expansion. And the colors is as follows. Uh, they are E. coli that uh, in all uh, respects are identical, except that they have uh, uh, carry they carry with them two fluorescent labels so one of them uh, labels uh, red and the other labels uh, fluorescence greens uh, uh, in color green uh, when they put the drop in the center uh, it's a mixture of uh, both types of bacteria and because uh, they are very small the green and red are mixed together and you don't see individual colors but as uh, this expansion proceeds, uh, very clear uh, sectors that are either green or red are developed. And uh, the reason that uh, you don't have the mixture of colors when you're out here in the front of this range, range expansion is of course uh, the following, that all the children of the green bacteria will be green, all the children of the red bacteria will be red, and uh, there is going to be no mixture uh, of colors once uh, there have been established sectors of one color or the other. Uh, you can, or they can also perform this same experiment rather than putting a drop in the center of a plate by putting a uh, blade uh, and uh, 
uh, having the bacteria start from a straight line, which is the edge of the blade, and then grow into the plate. And so that's a, uh, another type of geometry uh, that is uh, less uh, uh, influenced by curvature and is uh, kind of easier to uh, uh, examine, theoretically. And in particular, the first thing that we are going to be thinking about is the boundaries between the green and red sectors, how they fluctuate. So there is these fluctuating boundaries between the sectors. You can see them in the circular geometry or in the uh, flat growth geometry. And we would like to distinguish and characterize what these uh, uh, boundaries are doing. Now, the simplest model that you can make for this process is uh, what is indicated here, and it's called the stepping stone model. Uh, so for this particular demonstration, let's say that at the level of where the blade is, we have put uh, bacteria that can fluoresce in many colors rather than two colors. But then the process is that each bacterium uh, can give rise to one or two offsprings next to where it is. And uh, that's how it grows. And since some of the bacteria will not have offspring, the number of colors very rapidly decreases. And here at this time slice, we only have two colors. Now, if we focus on the boundary between these two colors, it can randomly move to the right or to the left. So it is going to execute a random walk. So an example of that boundary is, let's say we focus on the boundary here between the blue and the purple, and it's essentially doing a random walk. And because in the random walk, we have these characteristic fluctuations, uh, the fluctuations in the transverse directions perpendicular to the growth direction are going to scale as the square root of the number of steps in the time-like direction in which the growth takes place. So this model would predict that the fluctuations of these boundaries should be this characteristic diffusive behavior. But when they go and look at these fluctuations in the experiment, they find that the extent of the fluctuations, rather than being diffusive, is more than diffusion. So the straight line could have indicated the uh, x squared proportional to t, which is the characteristic of diffusion. And what they see is more like x squared proportional to t to the four thirds, which is a faster super diffusive phenomena. So a small variation of the model can describe that. So all we need to do in the previous model is to not uh, ask uh, the uh, process to take place step by step, but to uh, allow the bacteria to grow wherever uh, they, they want without requiring this step by step, uh, uh, layer by layer growth that we had uh, posed uh, previously. As soon as we don't require these layer by layer growths, the surface becomes rough. And uh, in addition to that, when they look at the statistics of these sector boundaries, the statistics of the sector boundaries become super diffusive, exactly as was seen in the experiment. So uh, uh, one needs to include the roughness of the front in order to understand the phenomena of range expansion and the fluctuating sectors that was seen in the experiment. And uh, uh, this is uh, the roughness of the front is a well-known story. And basically, uh, one can say that the velocity with which the front is expanding, uh, once we allow it to be non-flat, can depend on both the curvature indicated by the Laplacian, whether you are curved upward or curved downward, as well as the local slope. And uh, because of the uh, uh, symmetries uh, uh, of uh, the, the thing that you should have, the first nonlinearity that will occur is uh, the gradient the slope squared. Uh, 
the characteristic of this equation is that the fluctuations in the x and t directions are related through the super diffusive exponent and this could be an expl uh, explanation of the experimental results that we have over here i'll stop here for uh, one minute to see if there is any question Okay, then I'll continue. Yes. Uh -huh. yes. So to chat ask به زبان فارسی سخنرانی بشود من میتونم به سوالاتون که اگه به زبان فارسی باشه جواب بدم ولی بعضی از کلمات علمی رو من معادل فارسیش رو نمیدونم و ترجیح میدم که به انگلیسی باشه ولی اگر سوالی دارین من جوابتون میتونم یک سوالی هم الان در چت نوشته شده من الان why uh, uh, some bacteria kinds stopped growing uh, okay so uh, basically uh, what is happening is that uh, uh, they uh, did not stop growing they gave rise to children and their children continue to grow so basically, uh, this front continues to expand, except that all of the uh, children here happen to be children of things that were green and will continue to go green. And here uh, it is uh, all the, the red and they continue to grow red. So uh, uh, nothing stopped uh, growing. Their, their children just carry the color that is associated with their fathers. Uh, but uh, as we look further and further on the expansion front, the number of colors disappears uh, for the same reason that uh, uh, many of, uh, uh, let's say, people who lived in the past uh, don't have any uh, children in the current generation and many of us are uh, descendant of uh, a fewer number of people that uh, lived in the past. So uh, what is happening is indeed this process that the number of colors and the diversity of the population is changing and getting less and less as time goes on and eventually if we were to uh, wait long enough there will be only one color that will be dominate and all, uh, all the other colors would go extinct so basically uh, the process by which some of the colors disappear is that the edges of this uh, uh, colony uh, as they execute this random walk will eventually collide and that color will completely disappear. Now in this picture you also see these black lines. What the black lines are doing, they are tracing the lineage of the bacteria on the front. So if I take one bacterium on the front and ask uh, which cell did it come from, which cell did that one come from, I can continue and look at the trajectory of its parentage. And the interesting thing is that uh, if we look at two bacteria that are out here, we can go back and see when their uh, uh, most close uh, uh, parent uh, existed. So basically we can find the closest common ancestors of the different uh, bacteria on the front through these uh, black curves. And both the genealogical curves and the sector boundaries 
perform this super diffusive behavior and uh, their coalescence indicates either the extinction or uh, the location of the closest common ancestor. Now, if we were to look at this process in more detail, we can ask the question if we have a segment that is of size delta x, typically how far I have to go in time for that segment to disappear and go extinct. So there is a rate at which uh, two of these uh, super, uh, two of these uh, 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 boundaries coalesce after some particular time tau. And if the process that is uh, look, uh, governing the fluctuations of these boundaries is diffusion, that's a very well-known problem of uh, statistical physics uh, uh, going back to Chandrasekhar and earlier and it can be solved by the method of images and one can uh, easily calculate the probability that two diffusive paths that are separated by distance delta x will intersect and collide after a time top. And it's given by this formula, which is essentially the derivative of a Gaussian type of uh, function. Now the corresponding formula for one uh, when it, one is dealing not with diffusive path but super diffusive paths here uh, was not known, so we could not really do this uh, uh, the answer. We could not obtain the answer by uh, uh, analytical formula. So we did simulations, and what we find is that the probability that a segment of length delta x disappears after time tau uh, has a scaling form that is governed by this uh, uh, super diffusive relationship between space and time and has uh, an exponential form for when the separations are very large and has a linear form uh, when the separation is small. And I should say that this linear form we only have from numerics. We have no reason a priori not to have thought that this would be delta x to some other power. And it came out to be linear from the simulations and we don't have an explanation for that. So there are these uh, technical details, but the uh, sort of uh, simple way to explain the story is the following that because of the roughness of the boundaries, these sector boundaries and genealogical paths have this super diffusive character. And the simple consequence of that is that the genetic diversity uh, is destroyed and goes extinct more rapidly. You can see that in this picture that has a rough boundary, there are fewer colors compared to the case where you have uh, this kind of layer by layer growth. And secondly, that the common ancestors are going to become uh, more recent and fewer in this picture compared to that picture. So that's a specific uh, result of the way that this range expansion takes place. So once more, essentially, because of uh, uh, this uh, collision of boundaries, gradually various uh, uh, colors go extinct and uh, uh, there is uh, uh, this scaling formula that governs the way that these extinctions take place. But I should say that this type of extinction is when the different bacteria are almost identical. So essentially in the experiment, the two bacteria were growing at the same rate. They just happen to fluoresce at different colors. Now, that is uh, actually not the most generic case. We would expect that uh, uh, one of the bacteria is, uh, uh, has some genetic advantage over the other and will grow more rapidly. So I wanted to sort of introduce some of the terminology that people that describe the uh, population evolution uh, talk about. So essentially the rate at which uh, the number of some particular bacteria changes as a function of time depends on its growth rate that is sometimes called fitness. And uh, 
in the absence of anything else, it would be essentially an exponential growth. Now, if I have two species that are exponentially growing, uh, then, then I can ask what is the fraction of one species? And if I look at the evolution of the fraction from this part of the equation, I find that the evolution of the fraction is proportional to the uh, product of fraction one minus fraction, because you're essentially allowing one or the other. And the rate at which it changes is the difference between the two growth rates. So that's the competition as to which one of them is growing more rapidly and has more children. But additionally, there could be mutations. And as a result of mutation, say, species A can be converted to species B, or species B can be converted to uh, species A. And so the result of those for the fraction is indicated over here. Uh, so that's part of the story. The other part of the story is that uh, uh, there is uh, motion of the particles. Here I was just uh, looking at one variable, but these variables, the numbers actually could uh, uh, be uh, distributed in space, and then there would be diffusion or migration. The other part of the story is that uh, uh, reproduction is not a pure exponential. There is randomness in the process. Some of the species may have children or may not have children, and the result of that stochasticity, sometimes called demographic noise, is that there is some random number that changes as a function of space and time, that modifies the equation that governs the fractions. Now, if uh, uh, the form of this noise you can see is chosen so that if uh, you have completely one fraction or the other fraction and there is no mutation, then nothing happens. Essentially what we were seeing before, that the region that is green can and it is uh, the extinction transition that is characterized by this equation is known to belong to the directed percolation universality class. And one example of this type of uh, extinction uh, would be to go back to this uh, layer by layer growth that I was describing before. And uh, essentially F indicates the color being uh, one or the other as I go from zero to one. And uh, uh, the different layers correspond to different evolution in this time of this equation. And uh, so one can then characterize again, uh, the nature of the fluctuations, the scaling of the different uh, regimes, and eventually how eventually one color uh, will become dominant and the other color will go extinct. Now, the thing is that we saw that uh, this type of layer by layer growth is not what actually takes place in range expansion, but that the surface becomes rough. And so then the question is whether this directed percolation universality class that people said governs the extinction transition 
is also valid when one has this kind of rough growth. And uh, what we saw was that the uh, velocity of the interface could be a function of the local curvature and slope. Why should not the different growth rates as well as mutation rates also be influenced by the local curvature and slope? And so in principle, one could generalize uh, the growth and mutation rates that I had written before by saying that they could depend on the local geometry uh, through curvature and slope. And uh, uh, additionally, the growth velocity, uh, maybe it is different for the gray regions or for the blue regions. So one should add a term here that says that uh, uh, there is a difference between the growth velocity of the blue and the gray regions characterized by different values of F. And uh, so if we couple the two equations that govern the height of the surface as well as the fraction, uh, we find that the lowest order terms that one can indicate in a gradient expansion are the ones that I have indicated in red. And uh, we, along with Joel and Horowitz, try to analyze these equations through the normalization group. All we could say was that the, the nature of the phase transition between these two cases is different, but we could not find what the exponents were for the actual phase transition. I think I'll stop here again because I think I saw a number of questions that were appearing in the chat. There is a question I see is how the cell's time division changes the range expansion here. Everybody's quiet. Okay, so let me go to the next topic that is less uh, uh, mathematical. So we try to look at the extinction transition from the perspective of this field theory that was coupling the height and the fraction. And uh, uh, we wrote the most relevant equation uh, terms in the equation and we uh, uh, showed that uh, uh, there will be a different universality class, but we could not capture that. But the point is that the extinction transition is just a small part of the story. And uh, what uh, one sees mostly when we are uh, looking at growing films is the shape of the front. And uh, it turns out that the type and the shapes or morphology of the films that one gets is uh, determined by these parameters that I had introduced before in the equations, even when we are away from the uh, extinction transition. So let me remind you what uh, these uh, important terms are. One term is this parameter G that says that if you have two type of species, which one of them uh, produces more children than the other, which one in the language of uh, uh, evolution, which one of them is the fitter species. Uh, if uh, this parameter G is zero, the two species are equally uh, uh, fit. It's a neutral case, which was what was shown in the very first experiments that was uh, uh, this uh, I showed you for range expansion. But most of the time, one species will be dominate over the other and will tend to grow. And so this uh, parameter is G characterizes the fitness advantage. The other parameter that we introduced was uh, that the two different species that are correspond, let's say to F equals to zero and F equals to one, don't grow at the same rate in the height direction. Uh, maybe you can imagine that one of the uh, bacteria is uh, larger in size than the other. 
And so if it is larger, then this alpha would be positive and its height would grow more rapidly. Uh, there is this other parameter, lambda, that depends on uh, the rate of the growth, how it depends on the slope. And uh, a simple way to see that is, let's imagine that we have uh, a layer that grows uh, by some velocity v normal to itself. Then we can ask how much has the height changed at some position x then there is a simple trigonometric relationship between the growth normal and the growth in the vertical direction, uh, which gives you what the value of this parameter lambda is going to be. For this simple picture that I have shown you, it is very easy to show that the value of lambda is the average growth velocity over here. But this is one type of model and in fact, for this uh, brick layer model that I showed you, the parameter lambda is not positive, which is what would have been here. It is negative because if one uh, tries to grow at a slope, the number of available sites to grow will decline. And so the parameter lambda for this type of uh, uh, process would be negative. So the point is that these parameters that I introduced for you are important, whether they are zero, they are positive or negative, determines the shape of the uh, eventual film that grows. To demonstrate that, let's look at the simplest case where uh, uh, the two colors, uh, gray and uh, blue, are equally fit. But let's say that the gray bacteria, bacteria are, are larger, larger in size, size and, and they then try they try to expand, expand more rapidly. rapidly. Then, then you would imagine, imagine that, that as, as is seen in these pictures, pictures the gray bacteria that are larger in size will bulge out of the growing blue bacteria. But we see that two different morphologies are possible. Either you have a bulge that is like the left picture or this faceted bulge that you have, you have like, like the right, right picture. picture. And, and they, they correspond, correspond to this parameter lambda being positive or negative, which uh, can depend for different growth conditions. For when lambda is positive, the blue species, because lambda is positive, they grow, grow faster, faster, faster if it becomes, it becomes sloped. sloped. And, and, so and so it becomes sloped to grow faster and, and catch up, up with the gray species. species. Whereas, Whereas when lambda, lambda is negative, negative the, the gray, gray species slopes so that, that it grows slower and can catch up with the blue. The blue. So different so morphologies, morphologies can emerge, can emerge from, different from different values, values of, this of this parameter, parameter lambda. lambda. As, I, As said, I said, this, this is, is the case, case where, where the in-plane in growth of, of gray, gray and blue, blue is kind, kind of neutral, of neutral. They're they're growing more or less at the same rate. rate. But, but if, if, let's, let's say, the blue, blue has uh, a fitness advantage and, and expands in plane, plate, in the in plane, plane, then again, then depending again, on, depending uh, on the choice of these uh, parameters, of these parameters alpha, and lambda, alpha and lambda, whether they are positive, they are positive or, or negative, or negative different, uh, different uh, uh, morphologies, morphologies can emerge. Can emerge. Uh, uh, for example, for example on, on the left, left the, blue the blue is, is smaller the smaller species, species so doesn't, doesn't uh, grow. grow out, out, but it but then then inward, inward depending, depending on the sign of lambda, lambda the inward, inward then, then can, can either, either be circular, circular or can, can be shaped, be shaped and, and faceted. Uh, alternatively, when, when it is something that, that is growing outward, outward depending, depending on, on the sign of lambda, lambda it can, can be either faceted or uh, arc -like. like. Now, very recently, very recently, there was this experiment, experiment that, that was performed, performed by, by the group of uh, uh, JF4 uh, at, at MIT. MIT. And uh, what they observed was that there was uh, a case where they had a red bacteria that would sometimes mute 
generate very similar pictures to the one that they saw experiments uh, using the equations that we had before for the appropriate choice of these parameters. Eventually, one of the colors will dominate and take over completely. Uh, okay. Actually, any questions at this point? Okay, finally, uh, let's go back and look at the uh, equations that were describing how species now more than two, let's say, in the XY alpha are growing at uh, some rates G alpha. So these would sort of have exponential growths of the species. We can allow mutations between the different species. We can allow diffusion. But if we stop over here, then we have essentially limited ourselves to the linear form of these evolution equations. The advantage of just looking at linear forms is that it's a problem that is exactly solvable because a linear equation, you can always uh, evolve as a function of time using the uh, exponential of the operator that uh, uh, implements this linear evolution. Uh, but uh, this equation is not particularly good to describe an actual population because the total number of species is going to grow or decay exponentially. So eventually something has to come and stop the exponential growth. Uh, now, what we can do is rather than looking at uh, the individual numbers that are growing exponentially to look at the fractions. Now the fractions are going to be limited between zero and one. And we look at, if we look at the equation that governs the fractions where the actual numbers are exponentially uh, growing, the fractions we find satisfy the type of equation that we wrote before, that is a polynomial in the fractions, uh, allowing for mutations between the different species the diffusion operator, however, has an interesting form because when I form the Laplacian of the fraction, in addition to the Laplacian of F itself, I will generate a term which is the dot product of the gradient of F and the gradient of the log of the total number. It's a simple algebra that you can perform to convince yourself of this. So this is interesting because this logarithm of n appears in this equation. So maybe what I can do is I can look at a very different model in which I just make the mathematical transformation to call the logarithm of f, uh, the logarithm of this uh, total number to be something like a height function h. Uh, this mapping then converts uh, the equation for the total number to an equation for the log of the total number, which is the height function, which is very similar to the kind of equation that we had uh, proposed earlier, where the height velocity depends on the uh, curvature on the square of the slope, as well as uh, what fraction of uh, which species is present uh, which one of them grows more in the h direction. And the equation for the fractions also looks very much like the equations that we had written with some of the terms absent and some relations between the different terms without any of the stochasticity. So these are deterministic equations. Now the advantage of this perspective is that uh, uh, the linear equations I can solve exactly. Since I know the solution to the linear equation, I can find the solution 
to this range expansion in which I have a surface that is evolving along with the fractions uh, that are creating that surface in the first place. And so, for example, uh, the height function, which uh, is the exponent, uh, uh, which is related to the number through this equation, the number is the sum total of the different numbers of the species and alphas. And each one of them, in the absence of mutation, I can use the uh, diffusion kernel to see how they evolve as a function of time. And then I can take the logarithm of this equation to figure out what the height function is. And so this is an example of the type of picture that this kind of deterministic growth uh, generates. Now we can forget about uh, uh, all of the steps and just focus on what this picture represents. So what this picture represents is an initial profile where rather than, let's say, a straight edge, I inoculated the bacteria on a curved front. And some portion of this curved front is higher, some portion of the curved front is lower. And what I did was I made sure that the top of uh, the highest portion of this profile, I inoculated with this green uh, uh, bacteria. And then what uh, this equation allows for me to do is to figure out how this growth process proceed, how the shape of the front changes, and how the different species evolve in this particular picture. Now, a characteristic of this type of growth is that you generate these arc-like pictures. And what is interesting is that the uh, color of each arc can be traced back to the maximum of the initial height profile that gave rise to that. So all of that is fine, but what is more interesting about this picture is that the blue species was actually less fit than the gray uh, than the gray species so if i had done exactly this picture but inoculated rather than on this profile on a straight profile then as a function of time the blue species would have uh, shrunk and disappeared whereas because i gave it an initial geographic advantage it could establish itself and grow as a niche. So this is kind of an interesting mathematical illustration of uh, the advantage of uh, being born in the right place, if you like, and uh, having that advantage of the initial uh, location, uh, this species that otherwise would have uh, completely gone extinct think much more rapidly for a certain amount of time can establish for itself a geographic area in which it grows and uh, uh, is happy to stay. Okay, so let me summarize the different things that uh, I said and uh, then take questions. So we started with this uh, experiment that described two completely equivalent neutral bacteria uh, that were growing into a new uh, environment. And as they grow into a new environment, the bacteria in the front uh, uh, compete with each other. And it is much more likely that because of chance, one of them will uh, 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 randomly become the dominant species and the other one goes extinct. And uh, the roughness of the front uh, speeds up this process of uh, uh, going towards extinction through the fact that the sector boundaries, the genealogical tracks, etc., uh, carry the dynamics of the roughness of the front that is super diffusive and uh, rather than being x going like t to the one half grows much more rapidly as t to the two thirds. Now, whereas these two pictures pertain to the case 
where the species are completely neutral and one does not have a fitness advantage, if one of the species has a fitness advantage over the other, then the equations that govern both the height of the interface and the evolution of the fraction become coupled to each other and more complicated. There are four uh, uh, couplings that are relevant when one does a gradient expansion. And uh, all we can say is that they give rise to a new type of scaling, which is different from directed percolation, but one needs to uh, do uh, numerical simulations or other calculations to figure out what the characteristics of this universality class are. But independent of that, we can focus on growth morphologies. And depending on the signs of the various parameters that appear in this equation, different morphologies for the way in which uh, one uh, species expands and modifies the shape of the interface uh, takes place. At least one of these different species has already been observed in experiment and characterized, and it would be good to see whether other forms of these types of morphologies can also be seen in different bacteria. The other thing that is interesting is that some limit of these equations without noise can be solved exactly, and they demonstrate this process by which the advantage of a location uh, can lead to a species establishing a niche and uh, surviving, whereas if they were not uh, similarly geographically advantaged, they would have disappeared. So uh, uh, this work was done in collaboration with uh, uh, former student Sherry Chu, who along with David Nelson and uh, Daniel Weller uh, did the part about the coalescence. Uh, Jordan Horowitz uh, was involved with this uh, extinction transition, generalizing directed percolation. And Daniel Swartz is a new graduate student who generated these different growth morphologies. So thank you very much for uh, your uh, attention. And I'm happy to take questions either in English or in class. <laughs> If we have a bacteria that can divide so fast, can any other bacteria survive? If yes, how they win against the speed one? Is there, uh, okay. So um, this picture that I have over here, actually, let me go to the previous one, it's bigger, is an example of precisely what you have. That is, the gray bacteria are, in fact, reproducing faster uh, than the blue ones. And so if everything else was equal, very soon the gray bacteria would have eaten the blue ones away. But here, the blue ones are given advantage of being in a high position. And if you like, over here, the bacteria that are gray that on a flat surface would have very easily pushed aside the blue ones, they find it hard to move up the slope. And so uh, the uh, reproduction rate of the gray bacteria is diminished because they also have to do the work of growing up this uh, uh, curve, whereas the advantage of the blue ones has increased because all they want to do is uh, slide downstairs. So there are mechanisms by which uh, uh, exactly the question that you asked, uh, uh, bacteria that uh, divide naturally faster because of geography, they cannot uh, uh, overcome the slower ones.
که سوالی خب یه سوالی آقای درخشان پرسیدن من الان سنجاقش میکنم Would you please explain details of the noise have been used in the height scale equation? Uh, aha. فکر میکنم سوالتون مربوط باشه به که چرا در اینجا ما موفق نشدیم که یه یونیورسالیتی کلاس پیدا بکنیم. Uh, برای uh, اینکه این مسئله اکستینکشن و یونیورسالی کلاس دایرکتد پرپولیشن رو توصیف بدیم باید یه دونه اکویشنی بنویسیم که شباهتی داره به تایم دیپندنت لند او گینزبرگ اکویشن ولی uh, این نویز متناسب نیست متناسب با سکوئر روت این وریبال F چرا؟ برای اینکه ما میخواییم که اگر F صفر باشه برای همیشه صفر بمونه چون اگر شما مثلا اینجا آبی هستین و آبی میوتیت نمیکنه به گری و فقط بچه های آبی خواهد داشت تا ابد باید آبی بمونه بنابراین هیچ نویزی نمیتونه اینجا وجود داشته باشه و این رو توی اکویشن اینجوری نشون میدین که نویز متناسبه با یک دونه نمایی از F و اگر شما برگردین به این معادلاتی که نشون میده که چجوری شما رپردیوس میکنین خیلی راحت میشه نشون داد که نویز باید متناسب باشه با جزر F و بنابراین معادلی که باید معادلی که فیل تیوری که باید حل کنین نویزی که داره این حالت سکوئر روت آف F رو داره که یه کمی مشکل میکنه حل کردنش رو ولی خب بازم از برای دایرکت پرکولیشن این یونیورسالیتی کلاس رو از طریق رینورمالیزیشن گروپ نگاه کردن و کاری که ما کردیم اینه که این یونیورسالیتی کلاس رینورمالیزیشن گروپ که قبلا نگاه شده بود این عبارات جدید رو بهش اضافه کردیم و چیزی که دیدیم اینه که این عبارات در باز به هنجارش که میگن ریلیبنت و این ریلیبنتش جوریه که هیچ فیکس پوینتی ما نتونستیم براش پیدا بکنیم که بتونیم توی فیل تیوری حد اقل بگیم که یونیورسالیتی کلاس جدیدمون اکسپوننت چی هست اگر این سوال شما نبود لطفا دوباره بپرسید من یه جواب دیگه خیلی ممنون آقای اگر سوالی هستش شفاهی یا همینجا تو مسیج هم بنویسیم بکنم سوالی نیست دست شما درد نکنه آقای دکتر خیلی سخنرانی خوبی بود و بازم ممنون که دعوت ما رو پذیرفتیم با هم باز افتخار ماست ممنون. خیلی ممنون که دعوت کردیم دست شما درد نکن خب. خدا, خدا نگه دارتون باشه ممنون خدا حافظ شما من یه نکته ای رو قبل از اینکه خداحافظی کنم بگم دوباره یادآوری کنم فردا روز دانشجویی دکترا هست بچه‌ای که اینجا دکترا میخونن به صورت ارائه کوتاه کاراشون رو توضیح میدن و روز پس فردا که روز چهارشنبه هستش سخنرانی ها از ساعت 11 شروع میشه برنامه رو روی وبسایت میتونید نگاه کنید ساعت 11 سخنرانی خیلی جذاب هم هست با دکتر وحیدینیا که در مورد در حقیقت تحلیل ابعادی میخوان درس بدن خیلی ممنون امیدوارم که امروز سخنرانی به درتون خورده باشن و روزتون به خیر تا برای سخنرانی ها تا چهارشنبه و تا فردا برای روز دانشوانی دکتر خدا نگه دارتون.